it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this Amber Terry collaborative work on the drivers to coal phase down in India. And the part one of this collaborative work focuses on the battery cost decline. Very warm welcome to all of all the panelists and the online attendees. India, as we all know, has set a net zero target of economy by 2070. And in order to achieve the same, various sectors of economy are required to achieve net zero in time frames much earlier than 2070, depending on the feasibility of achieving net zero and the cost trajectories of various technologies. Power sector, which contributes most of the GHG emission in India should be and is the first priority in the country. We all know that the power sector has set ambitious supply side target of achieving 500 gigawatt of non-fossil fuel-based capacity by 2030. However, achieving this requires scaling up of the efforts for addition of RE capacity in general, and especially the solar power, which is available substantively across the year and widely across the states in the country. However, as we all know that the solar power is available during the daytime and the wind energy is seasonal and it is concentrated into certain areas. Therefore, energy storage plays a very, very important role. It, in fact, it is a critical prerequisite for achieving the round the clock renewable energy supply, much beyond this, not only beyond the solar hours, but also during the non windy hours, and also to take care of the variability and intermittency in the renewable energy. Now, various kinds of storages are needed, whether it is a daily storage, whether it is a seasonal storage, and depending on the requirements, there are various options available in the country, starting from pump storage, the battery energy storage systems, and in the longer run, hydrogen or the concentrated solar thermal with the some storage like molten salt. Now, in order to integrate the storage into the scheme of things cost effectively, I think the cost trajectories are still a matter of concern for a developing country like India. And the present work which has been done by the Ember and Terry team is trying to look at one of the drivers for coal phase down, which is about the reduction in the battery energy system cost. So I think uh, this is what is the background in which we are having today's event. And uh, the uh, after I finish uh, my observations, uh, colleagues from Ember and Terry will give a presentation for about 20 to 20, 25 minutes. Thereafter, uh, we will have a panel discussion and uh, that I will take up as after the presentation. Now, uh, one uh, sort of a uh, mention to the online attendees, whatever questions they have, they can put in the chat box and we will, towards the end of it, when we have about 10 to 15 minutes we have slotted for the Q&A, we would like to take up those questions uh, to the best of our ability. So uh, with this, I hand it over to my colleague uh, Neshwin for the presentation. And he will be joined by Naeem from the Terry side uh, for this presentation. Over to you, Neshwin. Uh, thank you, sir, for the introduction. Uh, so, uh, Naeem and I will take you through uh, the broad findings of uh, uh, the study, uh, but do go through the report and uh, do reach out if this is something uh, that you're interested in. Uh, so, let me try to set the context. Uh, uh, and the background of all this is India's uh, net zero carbon emission target by 2017. Uh, which covers uh, the broad, broadly most sectors of the economy. Uh, but for this to happen, uh, the power sector will have to achieve close to net zero emissions much earlier than 2017. Uh, so at some point, India will have to uh, need to think about phasing down of uh, coal-based generation. Uh, 
uh, but considering India's dependency on coal-based generation, uh, uh, this is not going to be easy. Uh, India has around 217 gigawatts uh, of coal capacity, which generate almost uh, three-fourths of the total electricity in India. Uh, and we are talking about coal phase down uh, while the electricity demand is projected to grow at uh, almost 6% uh, annually. Uh, so all this is possible, all, all you know, uh, phase down is possible only uh, if we have uh, policies uh, directed towards certain drivers. Uh, and the purpose of uh, this collaboration between Ember and uh, Terry is to understand uh, the effect uh, or the influence of different uh, drivers to uh, the cost effective phase down of uh, coal in the Indian power sector. Uh, uh, this particular report uh, looks at uh, the effect of uh, uh, BESS cost declines, but in subsequent reports, we would also investigate uh, other drivers to coal phase down, which we have uh, broadly outlined in uh, this slide. Uh, but before uh, going forward, uh, and for the purpose of uh, this presentation, we would just want to uh, simplify our understanding of what we mean by coal phase down. Uh, uh, so broadly to simplify, we've divided coal phase down into three stages. Uh, stage one is when the growth of uh, coal generation slows down. Stage two is when we see a plateau in uh, uh, you know coal generation. And stage three is when we start seeing an absolute uh, uh, decline in coal generation. Uh, but before going into the different stages, let me just uh, try to set the context with uh, respect to coal uh, generation growth in India. Uh, the thing is, in the last three years, uh, coal generation has actually increased uh, at around a little more than 8.5%, 8 while the total generation grew at around 7% annually, which means that in the last three years, we've actually seen an increase in the share of coal. Uh, so the first stage logically should uh, be to slow down the growth of uh, coal generation. So for example, uh, if, if total generation increases at 6%, uh, you know, slowing down coal generation to 3% is something uh, that would be involved in stage one. Uh, the thing is that the techno-economics of uh, slowing down growth and increasing RE actually makes sense. Uh, because the uh, levelized cost of uh, energy from solar is actually cheaper than that of new coal. Uh, and this is to meet, you know, daytime demand. It is also cheaper than some, uh, than, than the marginal cost of some expensive existing coal power plants. Uh, moreover, the share of uh, solar currently is uh, uh, a little less than 7%, right? So, Till we increase the share to 25%, uh, uh, the need for storage is not going to significantly slow down the growth of uh, solar. And this is what we look at in you know subsequent slides. Uh, but before India can actually enter stage two, that is where we see a plateau in coal generation, we'll see instances where uh, solar with some amount of uh, battery storage might be cheaper than new coal, especially that new coal capacity is meant to just meet a few hours of uh, non-solar demand. And I think uh, we've already seen this happening with uh, you know, the cost effective of some of the FDRE tenders. Uh, so once we enter stage two, stage two is when uh, the uh, 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 cost of solar plus uh, battery storage is cheaper than uh, new coal uh, for any duration of supply during non-solar hours. Uh, but in this day, it is still not cheaper than the marginal cost of existing coal power plants. Uh, and when it does become cheaper than the existing cost of marginal uh, existing uh, the marginal cost of existing plants, we'll see an absolute decline in uh, coal generation. Uh, just one thing that I would want to highlight here is that it is clear that the less coal capacity we build uh, before stage three, the faster we uh, reach uh, stage three. Uh, of uh, the coal phase down in India. Uh, now, obviously, we are looking at uh, coal phase down for this study from uh, the cost optimal point of view. Uh, and there could be other considerations as well, when, uh, which could influence uh, coal phase down, right? But for the, for the purpose of this report, we are going to explore the effect of uh, battery uh, energy storage system cost declines 
on the least cost optimal pathway. Uh, so I'll just hand it over to Naeem now to take you through uh, the next uh, slides, starting with the methodology. Ah, thank you, Nishman. The next few slides uh, outline the methodology and the approach employed in our study to uh, systematically explore the least cost pathways uh, for India's power sector transition. Uh, so we have employed a PIPSA based co-optimization model to minimize the cost of uh, total cost of meeting the energy demand. Now, uh, why the minimum cost, uh, least cost? The importance of this least cost is that uh, by finding the least cost solution, we actually deliver on a lot of government objectives of achieving decarbonization goals at the lowest possible cost, making the transition suitable, sustainable, and affordable. Uh, as we explore the necessary least cost pathways, uh, phasing down of coal becomes inevitable. Uh, furthermore, in the uh, in the recent uh, in the recent developments, the decline of the decline in battery energy storage costs has been a game changer and will and has is surely uh, to affect the accel acceleration of this transition in the coming years. In this study, we explored the uh, optimal energy mix under various scenarios of best cost declines over the coming years and provide uh, so, so as to provide insights into how these cost reductions can actually accelerate the transition to a uh, low carbon power sector. We have employed a myopic optimization till the year 2032 to estimate the year-wise buildup of the capacity for generation and storage. Uh, another thing is that we have used a uh, single single node copper plate spatial resolution uh, in the model, which basically simplifies the analysis by assuming a perfect transmission. This allows us to focus on the generation capacity and the dispatch optimization without worrying about the complexities of the transmission network. Uh, coming to the temporal setup, the number of hourly timestamps considered in the investment year is reduced to 2016 hours at an hourly resolution to achieve a uh, more manageable simulation runtime, I would say. Uh, this slide is quite important in terms of the economics of what goes into the model and how the model behaves. So this basically presents the key cost assumptions and demand assumptions underpinning our analysis. Uh, if you look at the uh, coal cost, for coal-based generation, we have used a project cost of uh, rupees 85 million per megawatt and calculated the annual fixed cost component of existing coal-based capacity. Then taking into account the fixed cost liabilities, this estimate was then cross-checked with the annual fixed cost uh, component of for approximately 270 existing coal generators in India. Uh, for the for, for next the project costs for solar and wind energy uh, we utilize historical uh, project cost data from IRENA database and we also consider some other databases like uh, NEP and FITC the first Indian technology catalog by CEA uh, then uh, utilizing a uh, levelized cost of energy model we estimated these expected tariffs for solar and wind energy projects both. Uh, then we compared these estimates with the trends, with the recent trends we observed in solar and wind uh, capacity tenders uh, available uh, from 2020 to 2023, and then accordingly made some uh, necessary adjustments to ensure that our capital cost estimates were precise and aligned with these recent uh, tariff trends. Uh, similarly, for uh, BESS projects, we uh, again uh, use the use recent tariffs for standalone battery storage projects for 2024 to get these capital cost numbers. Uh, coming to the uh, assumptions on the decline of costs, uh, decline of costs from the input side, uh, the uh, uh, the battery storage costs are assumed to decline at a rate of seven percent annually, reflecting the uh, average reduction we have observed over the past several years. And furthermore, with the recent uh, tariff tariff trends going into uh, absorbing those, we did not we have not assumed any reduction in solar or wind project costs for this study. Uh, yeah. So here we outline the different scenarios considered in our analysis to assess the impact of 
varying rates of battery energy storage system cause declines on the Indian power sector and particularly on the coal phase down pathways. Since we have seen that the battery costs are, are, are a quite important factor to influence the transition in the coming years. Uh, in this, uh, the base case scenario which we have taken assumes a 7% annual decline in the best costs, which again reflects the average reduction over the past four years we have observed that it's going to be around the 7%. To explore more uh, aggressive transitions, uh, we, have, we are examining uh, scenarios with faster annual best cost declines of around 12, 15 and 20%. These scenarios basically help us to understand how uh, accelerated costs uh, accelerated cost reductions, I would say, in storage technology could influence uh, the optimal energy mix, uh, support the greater integration of RE technology into the grid, and potentially reduce the reliance on coal, and thereby significantly shaping the future of India's energy landscape. Now, for uh, now to brief on these scenarios and the results, I would uh, take it to Nishwin again. Uh, thanks, Naeem. Uh, so, in the next uh, few slides, uh, we'll talk about uh, the results for the base case uh, scenario. Uh, and uh, one thing that we observe is that uh, the least cost optimized pathway uh, would imply growth in generation that is going to be dominated by uh, solar and to some extent wind. Uh, so we see that most in, in the LCO pathway, most of the growth in both uh, generation and capa uh, generation capacity and generation is going to be uh, in solar and wind. Uh, and this shows in the figure on the right where we have uh, the uh, actual generation capacity and the actual generation in 2023 and the uh, model pathway uh, generation capacity and generation in the year 2032. Uh, one thing that we do observe is that uh, coal capacity buildup actually increases by around 72 gigawatts. Uh, which brings the coal capacity close to almost uh, 290 gigawatts uh, in 2030. Uh, but if we compare uh, the difference between uh, the generation in 2023 and the generation in 2030, uh, two uh, for coal, uh, we observe that uh, the difference in coal generation is actually quite marginal, uh, which points to the fact that the role of coal itself is changing and we could be looking at, you know, uh, uh, underutilization of uh, the fleet as a whole. Uh, one interesting uh, thing that we do observe is that in the LCO pathway uh, for the base case, uh, renewables, uh, which includes large hydro, uh, would uh, come very close uh, to uh, the coal generation by 2032. Uh, now, this uh, slide helps us build on uh, one of the potential barriers uh, to a fast-paced uh, coal phase down, and that is the need for battery storage. Uh, the, the the heat map, uh, the figure shows two heat maps uh, with the average hourly share of uh, renewables for each month for 2023, uh, which is based on actual data, and for 2032, which is based on uh, dispatch in the least cost optimal pathway. Uh, uh, for 2023, uh, we see that RE uh, peaks uh, during solar hours at around 35%, uh, whereas in non-solar hours, uh, it, it reaches around uh, a maximum of around 21%. Uh, in the modeled 2032 year, we see that uh, the maximum so, uh, renewables contribution goes from 35% to uh, you know uh, 83% uh, whereas uh, during non solar hours it increases uh, uh, from around 21% to only around 20, to only around 38% uh, which kind of highlights that as uh, solar share increases uh, the need for storage becomes more and more important now, obviously, this heat map uh, shows just the current year and the model final year. But if we look at the effect in time series, I think this problem becomes more clear. And that is what we see in this figure, which shows the share of coal generation, a bit of historical data. And post-2023, it's the LCO pathway. Uh, I think one thing that we see, uh, uh, that we observe from the study is that uh, 
the pace of uh, coal share reduction, uh, the, the black line, uh, is actually quite fast in the LCO pathway from around 75% in 2023 to, you know, 55% uh, in uh, 2028, following which we do see some amount of stagnation. And I just wanted to point out here that stagnation here can actually imply that as demand increases and coal maintains its share, uh, the absolute generation of coal could actually increase. Uh, uh, secondly, another interesting point here is that uh, the knee point at which the coal share starts uh, stagnating uh, also corresponds to the point in time where solar reaches 25% of the mix. Uh, so uh, this kind of overall implies that as we move or as we increase the share of solar from around 6.8% uh, today to around 25%, uh, the barriers associated to storage might not significantly have an impact on uh, the uh, you know pace of solar, but beyond that, you know it could be one of the biggest barriers to uh, solar uptake. Uh, and this is what we show in this particular slide. That is the need for storage as uh, the penetration of solar uh, in the total generation mix increases. Uh, our modeling uh, results suggest that as the penetration of solar in the grid increases beyond 25%, uh, the storage requirement increases non-linearly. So for 25%, as you observe, we have like we require less than 200 gigawatt hours of storage, but the moment you reach uh, 40 gigawatt, 40% uh, uh, penetration uh, for solar, you would re need almost 5x of uh, that capacity. And this is because you need to transfer bulk of uh, the solar generation from, so from solar RAS to non-solar RAS. So this uh, basically highlights a summary of uh, the base case scenario. Uh, and this kind of raises two or three questions when it comes to uh, uh, you know, battery costs and uh, coal phase down. Uh, the first is that if limiting uh, coal capacity build up is important for uh, uh, the cost effective phase down of coal, then how much uh, do battery costs or BESS costs have to fall to limit uh, uh, coal capacity build up? Or at, at what cost of BESS does solar and BESS actually become cheaper than coal? And to also broadly understand what is the relationship between battery costs and uh, uh, you know generation declines, absolute generation declines from coal? Uh, so we try to answer these uh, questions in the next two slides. Uh, uh, the first slide looks at the effect of uh, different battery cost uh, declines on uh, coal generation. Uh, this particular figure shows uh, coal generation for different battery cost declines in the LCO pathway. Uh, so the first thing that I want to highlight here is that uh, post-2023, we do see a slight increase in uh, coal generation. And this is because we've limited uh, uh, solar and wind build up to realistic values uh, associated to pipeline capacity and so on. Uh, but I think more importantly, the point that I want to highlight is uh, this red point here. This is a point at which uh, solar share actually reaches 25%. And the trends after that are something that are, uh, you know, the main outcome of the study. Uh, uh, beyond the red point, you'll see basically three types of trends. The first is uh, either a stagnation in coal generation uh, or an increase or a decrease. Uh, here, stagnation broadly implies that solar plus uh, 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 solar plus uh, BSS is uh, uh, cheaper than new coal uh, to meet a significant portion of uh, the non-solar demand. And an increase implies that it is not. It implies that solar plus best is uh, is more expensive than uh, you know uh, new coal. Uh, to meet a significant portion of uh, the non-solar demand. And I'm talking about shifting a significant portion of uh, solar from one hour to the other, not just 10 or 15 or 20% uh, like we have in the FTRGs. Uh, the other point uh, where we see a decrease in absolute generation is a point 
uh, where solar plus BES actually becomes cheaper than, starts becoming cheaper than marginal costs of many existing power plants. Uh, so basically two things we want to highlight from this is, and, and, and what we uh, find from our results is that uh, coal generation actually starts uh, plateauing when best BSS costs reach below uh, 7 million per megawatt hours. Yeah, I think this is also a very interesting uh, finding of uh, the study, uh, which shows the effect of BSS cost declines on one aspect of coal phase down, that is uh, the buildup of coal capacity. Uh, and this figure shows the coal uh, capacity for coal capacity buildup for uh, different uh, BSS cost decline scenarios. Uh, here, the white uh, dots or points show points in time where solar plus BSS actually becomes cheaper than new coal. So uh, this is these are points where the LCO uh, least cost optimized pathway stops building new coal capacity. Uh, and this point, interestingly, actually, this is a, a, a finding of the report that these points uh, correspond to when BSS costs reach around 6 million per megawatt hour. Uh, another interesting point here is that at a 15% decline in best costs, uh, 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 limits new coal capacity uh, build up beyond uh, 2030. So then it doesn't show any new buildup beyond 2030 and it limits the uh, total buildup to around 260 gigawatts, which is uh, what uh, the NEP 14 targets suggest. Uh, yeah, uh, interestingly, between the 15% and the base case of 7%, uh, so in the 7%, we do see, you know, coal capacity additions happening even till 2032 and the difference in the capacity is almost around 26 gigawatts. Yeah, now uh, obviously uh, the LCO pathway assumes certain uh, conditions that are required uh, for the LCO pathway to be realized, right? Uh, uh, one thing is the increase in annual additions uh, with respect to solar and uh, wind. Uh, so, solar need, so we need to increase solar to a point where on average we can add around 36 gigawatts of solar between now to 2032. And for wind, that's around uh, a little more than eight gigawatts. Uh, I think secondly and more importantly, uh, we also need to talk about uh, financing. So for so much RE addition, we need a lot more financing, particularly for solar and wind. Uh, so out of uh, you know the three seventy odd uh, 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 billion USD, two thirds would go into this to to solar and wind. And considering the Front heavy uh, nature of investments in solar and wind, financing would be important, uh, which is shown in this slide, uh, which shows the uh, uh, both the fixed and variable cost of the total cost of electricity. Uh, and we see as uh, this transition happens, the cost of electricity would increasingly be uh, influenced by the capex component, which is uh, the fixed cost component. Uh, which makes uh, the cost of financing uh, important and also influences uh, what the LCOA pathway itself is. Uh, secondly, uh, and another important prerequisite is actually the flexibility of uh, coal uh, based generation. Uh, we need mechanisms uh, that can incentivize and compensate uh, the uh, compensate for the additional costs uh, associated to coal flexibility. Uh, so uh, the the LCO pathway is possible only if uh, coal flexibility can happen. Uh, you know, frequent ramping up, ramping down, uh, and, and shutting uh, down of coal power plants is something that would be quite common. Uh, if this pathway is to be realized. Uh, and, and moreover, coal capacity would also operate at a much reduced PLF. And as per our modeling results, we observe that uh, the utilization could reduce uh, uh, as low as around 50% by 2032. Uh, and these are all considerations uh, that would influence uh, whether India can actually align with any of uh, the LCO pathways.
so to summarize, I think uh, uh, broadly, uh, we think that these are the three main things that would, uh, you know, uh, help us achieve a faster whole phase down. Uh, one is, as we uh, spoke about, is BSS cost declines. Faster BSS cost declines would uh, lead to lower uh, capacity addition as well as, uh, you know, uh, limiting the growth uh, in coal generation. Uh, better utilization and improved flexibility is actually a prerequisite. Better utilization can also help us reduce the capacities that, uh, capacity additions that we do. Uh, and finally, the most important thing is we need to increase uh, the annual additions when it comes to uh, both solar and wind uh, for us uh, to realize any of this uh, LCO pathways. Uh, and this brings me to the end of uh, the presentation and I'll hand it over to Saxena sir for the panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks to Nishwin and Naimka for presenting the work done by the Ember and Terry team on this topic of uh, extremely important topic. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you to the panelists who are there. And I would request the panelists to switch on their videos now. And now we have Mrs. Emmy Topo, Chief Engineer Integrated Resource Planning from Central Risk Authority, who has got a long experience of carrying out various types of studies which are required for integration of renewables to the grid. And uh, the not only she has done the studies which have been there so far up to 2030, CA is about to complete this study, which is to come out for the mid-century. And also, uh, she is uh, playing a lead role in the working group on net zero, um, constituted by Niti Ayo, wherein she is looking up to uh, the scenario up to 2070. So she has got a long and rich experience of the uh, studies which are required for integration of variable renewable news. Uh, very warm welcome to you, Amy. And after I introduce each of the, uh, all the panelists, I will request one, each one of you to be uh, speaking about. We also have the Mr. Abhishek Ranjan. Uh, now, I think finally he's able to join. Abhishek, I think you missed quite a lot of the presentation, but I think these are still some of the technical glitches which we have to uh, sort of uh, live with even in the current day when the technology has sort of progressed quite substantially. Abhishek, uh, we all know, has got a very long and rich experience in starting from a hydro generation company to working in a private sector distribution company, then in a renewable energy company, and now he is a partner at EY Town. I think Abhishek has a very, very long experience, and we have heard him a number of times, and his views will be extremely important in this topic. Now we have Samir Chandra Saxena, a esteemed colleague from my parent uh, organization, Central State Authority, wherein I think uh, now he's director in the Great Control of India. Samir has a rich experience of over three decades uh, managing the vast national grid, well-connected national grid, and the challenges which come on account of the integration of high degree of renewables to the grid. So very warm welcome to you, Samir. Uh, we have also have Mrs. Jyoti Gulia, who is the founder and CEO of GMK Research Analytics. She has about 17 years of experience in strategic consulting and research in the power and the energy sectors. Her focus is India and Asia Pacific. Very warm welcome to you, Mrs. Jyoti. And last but not the least, we have Mr. Aditya Lola from the Ember. He is the Asia Program Director at Ember. His expertise lies in public policy, technology development, energy systems design as such. Welcome, Aditya. Very happy to have you all in this panel discussion. Before I start the uh, sort of a requesting each of the panelists, the I think uh, we, we will have about seven minutes for each of the panelists to give the opening remarks. And I would request the panelists to talk about the presentation, what has been done. If there is any important aspect in the presentation which they would like to touch upon, whether whichever way uh, this is good or not so good or what more can be done or what needs to be looked into. 
and I will also have some specific questions for each of the panelists. And after the first round of uh, the uh, observations by the panelists, we could have the second round wherein we will have some common questions which could be answered by any of the panelists. Uh, that is what it is there. So I would request to the panelists, now we are at 1440 and we have to be finishing this by in 35 minutes and we have five panelists. So maybe about six minutes each we can do in the first round and the second round, I think we can have one or two minutes each. So I think I'll request the panelists to keep the time themselves rather than I think somebody pointing out, uh, pointing it out. So I think uh, first I would request Amy to be sort of a, giving her observations Having done the studies at the national level for the Pan India grid, uh, wherein you have seen that uh, with the increasing penetration of renewable, the uh, sort of a requirement of storage comes up. It comes up in which particular year? That is what is point number one. And with the technology cost, the cost trajectory of the storage devices, which is there, I think that becomes extremely important because what is of utmost important is that how do we meet the demand? beyond sunny hours and also in non-windy hours and also to take care of the variability and, uh, and intermittency. And you are well aware that there is uncertainty in regard to the technology cost trajectories. And given these uncertainties are there, if you will have any suggestions to say that what best can be done in such a scenario uh, replete with uncertainties so that one can sort of a walk through or move on this pathway with more degree of comfort for all the stakeholders. And I think you have done a lot of uh, technology cost uh, understanding has been developed by CA in uh, association with Dennis Energy Agency as part of the first uh, FITC, the technology catalog developed by the CA. So over to you, Amy, uh, please, uh, your remarks in general and the questions which I mentioned in particular. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm audible, I think so. Yes, you are. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, nice study has been done. Uh, the uh, presentation was uh, like the results which was being shown is quite similar to what we have we have also done in an alternate resilient scenario. Uh, so, uh, but I couldn't get what is the actual demand which they which the study has been uh, carried out for for 31, 32. So the demand was not shown. So basically, because demand is one of the very critical inputs for any type of this study. So once you see that what what is actually the demand for the terminal here, because we are talking about the capacity mix, optimal capacity mix for the terminal here. So if demand will be shown, it will be very uh, good to get a feel of what for what, which type of demand we will require, what type of capacity is required. Apart from that, uh, uh, I think I have missed or I don't know. Uh, the exactly so what is the storage capacity is required is, was also not shown in a business as usual case. So I think I missed or uh, I don't know. Uh, so um, how much gigawatt are and what is the inverter size was uh, there and what is the number of hours of storage was uh, uh, was the outcome of that study was also not shown. So if these type of things will be because most stress was given on the uh, coal based capacity and uh, uh, like uh, uh, anti best uh, cost if the 7% uh, uh, cost trajectory uh, annual increase uh, reduction of 7% is there then what is the best uh, whole capacity is likely to be so uh, we we lost your voice I mean I think it seems you got muted yeah. yeah. I'm already mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. So, uh, when we have carried out national electricity plan, after that, uh, last year, we have seen the demand uh, which has surpassed, surpassed the projections of the uh, electric power survey. So, based on the last two years' uh, demand, uh, which uh, uh, last two years' actual demand, we have carried out an alternate scenario where we have seen, where, where we have seen, uh, uh, mentioned that the if the demand peak demand increases by 5% as last year the peak demand uh, as per the projections uh, as per the 28 TPS projection the peak, actual peak demand was 5.6% more than the uh, projection. 
so if such type of trend will uh, take place till 31 32 or till 29 30 then what is the likely uh, capacity which is required so based on that study we have also found that around 283 gigawatt of coal based capacity is required but in that case the battery energy storage requirement also uh, increases drastically because definitely to meet that such increased peak demand of around 384 gigawatt by 31 32 we require a coal based capacity of around uh, uh, 283 gigawatt and along with that the battery energy storage also uh, increases to around uh, i think uh, it is uh, uh, it is 60 61 gigawatt of battery energy storage uh, was required along with five energy five hours of storage uh, this is in addition with the pump storage plants, which we are, uh, we, which we which we have modeled uh, with that. So pump storage plants of around twenty six gigawatt we are uh, envisaging. Uh, see, uh, because uh, this is still thirty one, thirty two. But mm -hmm. I'll just say definitely the mm -hmm. if the. Uh, so. Uh, Sorry for that. Yeah. Nah, uh, so basically, uh, you know, uh, when uh, definitely the bat uh, reduction in battery energy cost will definitely play a very crucial role. Uh, how the coal based capacity uh, uh, will further uh, what will be the what the role of coal based capacity in future uh, power system. Uh, but still, you know, uh, see. Uh, by 2030, we have to say, uh, our target is to set up 500 gigawatt of renewable capacity. And if we see that uh, uh, at present, we are around 150 gigawatt uh, of RE capacity is there. So 350 gigawatt in six years, we have to uh, like uh, uh, install. So that's a huge, humongous task uh, before us. That is also one of the like hurdle or we can say like, uh, we we need to work on that, uh, how to put up more and more RE capacity. Uh, that is one thing. Apart from that, uh, because I'll just touch upon by that, because we have carried out study for 2050 also. So just uh, by that time, our uh, duration, what we have seen is like uh, by 2050, if we put up so much of solar impact and wind capacity and energy storage requirement also in, uh, is there, then also we say there are few seasons and few months when we see that the RE resources are not adequate to meet the demand because there is no RE resources so that the arbitrage can be done and meet the non-solar and non-windy hours demand. So that type of uh, uh, that type of scenario we can we, we are seeing from the study and uh, from that only what we can say that we we require different type of technologies intervention also like we. Because we have to reach net zero, there is no uh, uh, nothing uh, going uh, towards that. So we definitely required a CCUS type of technology. Carbon capture is definitely required so that because coal uh, is required in a scenario where definitely when the RE energy is uh, not enough to meet the demand. So the, we, apart from the storage technologies, definitely other technology interventions are also required so that we can achieve this net zero uh, target. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, then uh, uh, we can move it to the next panelist. for this. Thank you so much, Amy. I think you have uh, sort of mentioned extremely important points. Two of the questions you posed about the demand and the storage capacity. I think at the end of it, uh, our colleagues will answer those questions. But I think extremely important viewpoint you mentioned about the uncertainty of the demand growth as what we have seen about in the last two years. And I uh, heard you speaking at the Niti Aayog working group also, wherein you mentioned that the growth in the peak demand is much more, whereas the energy demand growth is almost same as what has been projected in the electric power survey. So this is a point of concern. And you know, as more and more peak demand grows as compared to what we have estimated, I think the different kind of challenges are there. And I think the storage will become an important requirement. I think I will make my observations at the end because a lot of points which you have told about, we also found similar uh, observations in the mid-century study, which we have done at the Terry. So I think I will speak about them. But thank you so much for your very valuable insights into the uh, uncertainties which are there, why coal continues to remain 
as a sort of a, a source on which we have to continue to rely unless there are other things which fall in place apart from the cost of energy storage system which need to be followed. So thank you so much. Now, may I now request uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Abhishek Ranjan. I think Abhishek, I'm sorry that you couldn't uh, get an opportunity to sort of a look at the presentation, what was given by the team. Uh, I, uh, sorry for that, but uh, whatever you want to start with in general, I think the uh, the team made a presentation that the in order to sort of a see that the dependence on the coal gets reduced, the storage is important. But if we take the baseline scenario of 7% decline in this energy storage cost, then I think uh, the, we still are ending up with the higher values. So I think different scenarios have been considered wherein the decline in the cost with 12%, 15%, and 20% of battery energy storage has been seen and different observations has come out that what does that happen in which particular year start it should start to happen. Those type of observations are there. I think we will sort of a, not be able to sort of a tell you more detailed observations at this point of time. But I think uh, with your long experience in the sector, uh, you have seen that the battery energy storage system costs have declined very substantially in the last few months, three months or so, about 17, 18%. The tenders which were there from Gujarat and also we have seen that the cost declining in the Seki tender and the FDRE bits which are there. I think it increasingly becomes evident that the new renewable plus storage is going to be cost effective and the utilities should start thinking about it. Utilities should start planning about it. Now, from this perspective, Abhishek, I would like to ask you that is it time, is it the time is ripe now for the discounts to start uh, seizing the opportunity to develop the FDREs? That's question number one. And if so, then what concerns do you feel the distribution utilities may have about the FDRE costs, et cetera? And thirdly, I think uh, you may also be able to throw some light about why the uh, the renewable energy, various types of renewable energy tenders which are there remain undersubscribed. So with these three questions, I hand it over to you, Abhishek. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, am I audible clearly? Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, thank you. So first question first, you talked about decline in the battery storage prices and therefore the renewed interest in terms of uh, utilities or say REIAs like Seki who are putting up more and more RE plus solar and RE plus storage bids. Very recently, in fact, solar plus base Seki tender 1200 megawatt and 600 megawatt, 200 megawatt hour battery storage, uh, 3.41 tariff, very encouraging. This is very similar to rather cheaper than the hybrid solar and wind. Now, uh, the government of U UPTCL, I think they have come up with a tender of uh, four hour battery storage, which will be at their UPTCL electric substation, 223 kV substation. Now, long story short, if you see the factory prices trajectory, these prices which I'm talking about, even the 4.98, that is FDRE4, which is solar plus wind plus battery storage. Now, one thing for sure, the utilities and the regulator should start comparing these prices, not with the APPC, but especially the solar plus space not with the APPC, but with the, say, marginal cost, in which uh, slot the battery storage is getting used or discharged, which is not the norm. So that is an exception today. And that is how it is going to come up. But in this case, for example, 4.98, which is FDRE 4 for Delhi, if I compare the APPC also of some of the Delhi discoms, is much higher than 4.98. And forget about the... Uh, marginal cost, there are certain gas-based generating stations or even coal-based generating stations which are much, much higher, costlier than this. So definitely it makes a lot of sense for uh, grid parity in terms of tariff, which is demonstrable. And therefore, in the resource adequacy framework given by CEA as well as, say, uh, grid code of India, IEGC, battery, I think, now becomes a very important ingredient 
for preparation of the resource adequacy plan given the commercial viability and we'll see we are seeing a lot of tenders in the battery space what i think is the placement of battery storage within the distribution grid or even the stu grid makes and unlocks more value streams and i am not saying that the generation co located battery storage is not useful it is but then from a discom or a end consumer point of view the location of the battery within the distribution becomes more commercially and uh, which can be seen now but uh, so uh, then again your question was why fdris are unsubscribed or undersubscribed yeah see there are uh, multiple reasons for it uh, one is for example for putting up a 100 megawatt of fdri where a given profile or profile has been given in the tender so typically about 1.5 to 2 times of solar and respectively wind etc has to be uh, installed and 100 megawatt of fdri meaning say 200 uh, solar or maybe 150 solar depending upon the profile and similar quantity of wind so it's humongous so the risk associated with the fdri tenders today uh, are not very very clear to the ipps and therefore they are taking a very cautious step for saying that okay let's take up a very small step otherwise there will be huge burden of penalties for the next 25 years once they enter into the contracts so the the lack of understanding of the overall risk profile of such tenders the market risk basically 5% of it has to be on the market so uh, of course the price fluctuation in the market not predictable third is re forecasting itself so for example the wind patterns over the next 25 years weather modeling so all these factors and then the final one is the dsm uncertainty and the penalty being levied okay so all these risks are there which are inhibiting a major re ipps to full, go full throttled so if you see fdri 4 also that was uh, split into two parts okay and we have what we have seen is the result of the first part 600 something and based upon the outcome of this probably seki might float the second split part so uh, just to conclude the appropriate risk mitigation holds the key for subscription level of these fdri tenders and uh, as we know M mop has come out with the fdri guidelines and i'm sure with the experiences is the tenders probably there would be much more fineness and refinement of such policies in near future uh, what do you sir thank you abhishek thank you so much i think these are the sort of observations you underscored the uh, grid parity which is demonstrable by the battery energy storage systems or the fdri bits which are there and i think uh, the points which you told about the reasons for the risk associated with the uh, these uh, in this uncertain environment in regard to the large capacity which is required to be put up i think uh, thank you so much for giving those three four very important reasons for that thanks abhishek if time permits we will come back to you again uh, now may i move over to now my uh, mr samir chand saxena Samir, I think uh, your observations in general, and in particular about the demand and demand profile, you have seen over the years that demand profile is changing, and the demand is also getting shifted from the evening hours to the morning hours, and the peak is also getting shifted, and it has different sort of a connotations for the uh, the uh, states in which the demand shift is taking place, and also for the integrated grid as a whole. Now, I would like to request you that if you could also touch upon that, how do we sort of a factor in the changing demand profile in the studies which we do about? Generally, the practice is that uh, we are not able to see a long-term trend in the demand change, and that is why the demand change, trend change is not able to be factored in very appropriately. That's point number one. And the second point which I have uh, in mind is that Given the lead time between the setting up of a RE plant and the lead time for setting up of a transmission system, this mismatch brings into the certain issues for the developers. And also, how do we go in such a scenario that it does not become a big problem that the mismatch between the generation and the demand? And the in general, I think what best can be done to achieve the 
500 gigawatt target. I think ME very sort of a told, um, uh, specifically and explicitly told about 60 gigawatt per year we are required to do. The scale and speed with which we are required to move is extremely important. And what all should be done to be to make that happen. So over to you, Samir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, panel discussion. Uh, I must congratulate the team on the study that has been done. Uh, it is insightful. Uh, and uh, of course, detailing is required. And uh, like uh, Madam Emmy already pointed out uh, regarding the amount of uh, best that is there that is needed the load profile uh, that of course those details are need to be understood and what are the assumptions behind the study of course maybe once I go through the report probably I'll have a better understanding of all that but nevertheless congratulations to the team for having gone ahead with such a study uh, coming first of all to the first part of the question that you have asked sir about the uh, changing demand profile but before I come to that let me also make an observation about the report the report primarily from the three takeaways that uh, were presented at the end, uh, the battery ex uh, costs must decline by around 15%, 12 to 15% to be able to slow down or eliminate the coal growth. Uh, fine, it is good that uh, the study says so in as many words, but uh, my feeling is that as the demand for battery goes up, the costs, the rate of decline may not necessarily remain the same. So we need to probably consider different scenarios as to when we would be able to uh, look at those plateaus setting in or the decline actually is starting to come in. So those are one part of the technical side. Uh, what is the challenge from an energy security perspective? Because uh, you see, uh, it's not just about we, uh, wishing away coal or pro probably bringing in battery. Battery may not be a very, very long duration storage. We need to look at new technologies which are promoting long duration storage because ultimately uh, things like uh, gen uh, uh, entities like pump storage plants have a very, very important role to play in the future. And other than this, a lot of new technologies are also being explored. I think uh, those also must be considered as to what maturity level they are going to achieve and uh, what possibly they could contribute to the 2032 scenario. I mean, those aspects can also be considered. Now, coming to the demand profile, I must say that uh, last year has been exceptional. Even this year uh, was, um, I mean, mind boggling is just uh, not enough to say the word, uh, but uh, Last year, we have seen year-on-year -year growth. Uh, the CAGR, I think, has already mentioned about 6.4% is there. I think 2018, if we consider the base, 6.4% uh, is the demand growth. Not only is the demand growing, the shape of the demand curve is changing. Uh, but uh, com coming back to the demand growth, there are states who have seen 15 to 20% growth month on month in certain months. Uh, sorry, year on year on in certain months. So, I mean, this kind of growth is certainly very, very difficult to explain. There can be agricultural shifts. There can be sudden increase in uh, weather beating load, probably affordability, economic role has, uh, development of the economy has uh, uh, played a role into it. The weather beating load is in fact is becoming more and more predominant. And uh, we see it day in, day out. Uh, but the numbers are simply uh, mind boggling. In fact, this year, may we achieve 250 gigawatt in uh, uh, in solar hours and 234 plus gigawatt in non-solar hours. Uh, so this itself is a record. We were anticipating this to happen in sometime in August based on our past experience, but everything has gone haywire because of the weather unpredictability. And I think uh, once you are projecting your demand to 2032, I do not know and I'm not very sure how weather years have been considered and what kind of randomness in the demand, what uh, scenarios, because uh, like for instance, any RA study that is done, uh, I mean, we are also ourselves trying to do in that short term horizon. CA, of course, uh, Amy Madam is doing for mid-century and 2030, 2032 scenarios. Uh, we normally go up to considering 1000 scenarios of demand and uh, uh, we would uh, think that those are the kind of things that probably need to be done. 
Uh, the other part on the demand side is that while we are talking of uh, changing patterns, there are integration of new loads, the impact of EVs, uh, for instance, electrolyzers, data centers. I mean, these are large chunks of demand they are going to come in. And as yet, at least I do not understand how their demand profile is going to be. I do not know what they are going to behave like, what economic signals they would respond to. In fact, flexibilization of this demand is will have a very big role to play in being able to integrate renewables. So uh, this is about the changing pattern, in fact. So this pattern is going to evolve and we are yet going to see and learn about it. And you have rightly said that it is going to be extremely important to factor this in our studies and uh, in all, all the planning that we do in the, all the RA studies that we do. Uh, coming to the uh, behavior of this changing uh, load and generation patterns, I would also like to mention about the uh, changing patterns on uh, transmission line flows. You see, traditionally, uh, coal-based generation was, pithead-based generation was located in the center in the east and load centers in the north, west, and south. But look at RE, it has come at the other end. It has come in north, west, and south. And the lines which were initially thought to carry power in, in a particular direction are now becoming bidirectional. We were experiencing congestion in traditionally in import. Now we are experiencing congestion in export during solar hours and import in the other hours. So anticipating the demand profile and factoring it into the day-to-day -day, uh, diurnal patterns, seasonal seasonality, and of course, uh, the growth pattern, you know, this would be a very, very challenging part. Coming to the RE growth and the transmission, uh, here again, some historical uh, fact that earlier conventional plants had a longer gestation period and transmission generally used to come earlier. So we had a lot of discussion as to generation coming late and transmission coming early. The situation has re uh, reversed, just like the transmission flows. Here also we are seeing a drastic change. Now the generation is capable of coming up much faster on the ground as compared to transmission, where because of uh, heavy building of transmission, now we have started getting into the uh, phase of ROW issues also. So transmission is uh, being uh, going to become a challenge, but then I think uh, CA and ministry have done a, a good job in anticipating the 500 gigawatt uh, that is uh, required to be integrated by the targets and trying to plan for that transmission. And I understand a lot of it has already been planned. In fact, uh, I believe around uh, nearly uh, 250 gigawatt plus has already uh, been uh, either bid out or work has commenced. And the balance is in the detailed planning phases and a report detailed report has been brought out by CEA. So I think ad uh, advanced action has been taken so that timelines uh, match and transmission is not found wanting for uh, in terms of our integration. So I think uh, this is the other part. The third thing that you mentioned was what can be done for facilitating 500 gigawatt RE. Ultimately, uh, as a grid operator, we would suggest that while a lot of actions have been taken in terms of regulatory framework, policy initiatives, um, uh, kind of the ecosystem that has been developed in terms of markets uh, and flexibility norms and incentives, uh, a lot more needs to be done at the intrastate level. Ultimate users, ultimate buyers, are uh, they are the people who are going to buy that power. And here the role of, in future, the role of capacity markets is going to become important because saddled with a long uh, term commitments that the utilities are as of today, they are reluctant to procure more REA for which they have to handle variability and all. So we must find ways and means to introduce some sort of capacity auctions in the future. So we are able to have uh, more uh, capacity changing hands frequently, more frequently through shorter duration contracts, through market mechanisms and uh, more capacity integration. I think I would stop there and hand it over back to you, sir. Thank you, Samir. Thank you so much. I think all your uh, views and the perspective which you brought in regard to the what is happening in the grid in general and what is happening in some of the states in particular where the demand growth is uh, in certain months on a year to year basis. I think extremely high growth is there and I think it is a challenge. And of course, given the 
uncertainties or prediction of weather over a long term horizon. I think these challenges will continue to be there, but I think we as a, uh, the professionals have to sort of a sit together and put our minds together in regard to the estimation of demand profile to the best of our abilities. I think we can join hands and try to see what best can be done and various studies and can be done, scenarios can be developed so that the best possible way forward with certain scenarios, of course, a number of scenarios can be developed. Thank you, Samir. Thank you so much. Uh, now, may I uh, request uh, Mrs. Jyoti Gulia uh, with her long experience on the research and analysis side of the technology and other sort of options which are there. I think I have a few questions which uh, I have in mind for you. First is the, what are the major market trends you see in the RE technologies, whether we call it solar or wind, and also along with that storage. And I think uh, I fully agree with Samir when he mentioned it is not only battery energy storage, the various other forms of storage, but I think we have not discussed that today because the topic today solely confined to the battery energy storage systems. We at Terry have already done a study, um, brought out a report on the pump storage systems. We sort of are there, the lot of issues which have been brought about and what best way forward can be there. So all various forms of storage will be needed in our grid. And I think we have to see how do we find the best combination for meeting the requirements of the grid as they emerge from time to time. But I think a short term vision, a longer term vision has to be there. That is what is there. So that is the point number one, the what major trends you see about. And then about there is a lot of emphasis on the domestic manufacturing. And then when we talk about the domestic manufacturing, the cost effectiveness certainly comes to the fore. And that is what is extremely important. Now, how do you see about? Are there enough incentives for the domestic manufacturing to be able to make it cost effective or what more needs to be done? And then I think uh, third question would be given the reliance we have the currently on the import of key components and materials, I think uh, how is this going to affect our cost effectiveness and also our energy security? And the suggestions, if you have any in this regard will be very, very welcome. Over to you, Mrs. Jyoti. Thank you, Mr. Saxena. Uh, I think the report is very comprehensive. First of all, let me congratulate the team. It is very comprehensive and also I also have to go to go through it in detail to understand the complete complexities and the assumptions that are taken over this. But clearly, um, you see, you know, it is at the right time, I would say. The utility scale energy storage market is just starting to grow in India, including uh, battery energy storage. Uh, for So with respect to the first question, Mr. Saxena, that you had for me is what are the trends in solar, wind and battery that we are seeing is we are seeing this year they will be record solar installations. We're expecting the installations in solar in calendar year 2024 to cross 21 gigawatt. Uh, this will be record high compared to all the previous years. Um, that is what our expectation. On the wind side also, we expect the installations to be uh, almost double what it was last year. Uh, we are expecting close to 4.5 gigawatt of wind installations this calendar year. Uh, clearly, with a lot of new hybrid projects uh, in the open access market, the, uh, also there is a lot of new solar wind hybrid projects that are coming up that are there. So a lot of these things are leading to uh, scaling up of wind capacity in India. Uh, there is also on the, I would like to mention here is there is a huge uh, significant opportunity on the CNI market that is opening up, which is catering to both the solar and wind capacity additions. We are expecting this market to cross uh, almost six, six and a half gigawatt within this year, uh, which is almost, which is more than 30% uh, percent of your overall solar and wind installations, I would say. So the CNI market is also opening up. There are a lot of installations expected from there. With the IST is connected, uh, open access, CNI market also evolving. Storage will play a, a key role in to, to cater to that specific seg segment, which, which we foresee over the next few years. In terms of now the storage, uh, you know, this is just starting to grow. I mentioned RTC1, the 400 megawatt project by Renew will be fully commissioned this year along with other, uh, the peak power supply projects fund by Renew and Gringo also 
are expected to be commissioned uh, this year. So it will be interesting to observe and see actual on ground uh, analysis of how these live projects will perform and maybe a lot of uh, those uh, findings or those actual data from these projects will be helpful in these studies that we are doing right now also uh, in the demand forecast, in the actual assumptions that we are taking with respect to battery storage and other factors. So, it, so, so the market is just starting up, but I would say. Now on the um, the second question that you have, Mr. Saxena, for me was uh, on the domestic manufacturing side. See, uh, cost dynamics uh, will depend, um, you know, there are different perspectives on this. For a developers who are setting up their own manufacturing capacities, they will be able to take the advantage of high margins due to captive use. However, the ones who do not have captive manufacturing facility will be bearing the brunt of higher domestic module costs. So this is with respect to solar modules manufacturing only I'm talking here in near term until the market significantly de depends. Also, uh, because of domestic manufacturing, I think rooftop and other uh, marginalized markets or small markets may suffer decentralized manufacturing markets may also suffer from a lack of module supply and high prices also, especially the high-end tech products, including bifacial or top cone modules. That is what is likely in the solar side, uh, the trends that we foresee. But clearly the players were setting up, there we have seen a lot of IPPs, a lot of project developers who are setting up their own module manufacturing capacities, uh, including Avada, Renew, Ampe. There are many such players who are setting up their own uh, facilities. So uh, clearly they will have they will have advantage over others in terms of cost. Uh, on uh, the third thing that you asked Mr. Saxena, which is the reliance on the imports, I think Clearly, uh, the reliance will still be there on uh, uh, the international markets. However, a lot of developers are looking to have an alternate plan, which is a lot of other countries also doing, which is China plus one strategy. So not only from China, but other uh, markets also from where they can source their raw materials. A lot of, lot of players are also looking at that thing. So, uh, but... Having said that, the dependence is still there. And I think till the time, uh, the domestic manufacturing, because of PLI scheme and all, it will mature at a significant level, or I would say another uh, four to five years time frame, uh, you will see uh, the dependence will continue on the international markets and imports. So um, once the PLI uh, factories will be set up, the backward integration will set up, then you then you will clearly see uh, the prices also might soften that time and there will be less dependence on that. So I think I think I've answered all three uh, questions that I had for me, Mr. Saxena. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Jyoti. I think it's extremely helpful. I think, yes, we understand that. I think the, the incentives which are there in the country as of now, I think it will take some time for the benefits to accrue and I think uh, when gradually, but, but we are on track, I think uh, still the requirement of storage is gradually emerging and we have the various kinds of storage options which are there. I think uh, we are uh, comfortably placed, if not very badly placed, I would say. I think that is what is the picture which emerges. I think uh, last but not the least, I will request uh, the, my colleague from Ember, Aditya, to sort of a talk about two specific points. One could be that uh, our different countries positions positioned in regard to phasing down of coal, that is one. And number two, if you also touch upon this aspect in regard to the different Asian countries as compared to India. I think these two questions, given the shortage of time we have, I think Aditya, these two will be important for the audience to know and understand. Sure, you thank know. you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. And uh, yeah, it, is, it was really uh, like an interesting to get a lot of feedback uh, from other panelists as well. And and uh, I'm, I'm really happy to note that a uh, lot of the things that have been discussed are the things that we've also been discussing, sir. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think there is a lot of work to be done and uh, more of these reports will come out uh, where we'll try and address some of those things and incorporate some of this feedback. To answer your questions uh, more specifically, sir, I think, 
in terms of coal phase down i think it's something which is not uh, very well defined as such even in international lands it's something which has been adopted at cop uh, 26 i'm not mistaken and then i think after that uh, like you know every country is trying to figure out their own way and where uh, the stage in which they are at i think it really depends on the uh, the the context of the country and it also depends upon the starting points different countries have say for example in europe um, Uh, most of the countries are actually you could say that you know they are in advanced stage but but that's also because uh, they are in a place where they need to kind of cut down the reliance on coal they need to go from point a to zero uh, and 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 in these countries especially in europe you're seeing a structural decline uh, in in coal generation that's what our uh, recent report from earlier this year kind of showed uh, renewable energy share in the total uh, generation touched up to 44% whereas coal kind of fell from 30 to 12% in the last uh, uh, 10 to 15 years uh, in us it's kind of uh, slightly different coal, coal share is falling uh, but that's mainly because of the market forces rather than um, uh, as a matter of policy intervention Uh, but you're also seeing the gas share of gas kind of uh, increasing there as well so so the overall fossil generation share is kind of going up but but coal generation is kind of going there now if we kind of come closer to home and look at uh, some countries uh, like in, in asia like you know especially uh, china china is like has a very interesting dichotomy right so for years china has been building a lot of coal and also building a lot of uh, renewables and uh, Uh, but like it has been the case in the last uh, like you know decade or so but now it has come to a point where uh, like you know coal the, a lot of studies actually are indicating that coal generation is kind of going to peak uh, in the, in the next uh, few years and structural decline of coal is actually going to happen in the next uh, like you know uh, years or so to speak so you'll probably see china going into the stage 3 of coal phase down which nation laid out uh, like you know in, in, in this decade so the, the challenge is there in in, in uh, Uh, china with regard to coal phase down is uh, kind of different in countries like uh, indonesia uh, we're probably in stage 0 where demand is growing rapidly uh, not a lot of uh, uh, renewables is being built to meet that uh, demand and and i think uh, there are movements which are happening in southeast asia with regards to renewable energy market which are promising but i think you, you can probably say that they are in stage 0 uh, and then uh, you have uh, east asian countries like uh, japan and uh, south korea where uh coal generation is kind of uh, plateauing despite being a uh, developed country i think uh, 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 the renewable energy share is also increasing uh, generation is increasing in absolute terms but uh, their dependence on coal is continues to uh, be uh, stable so overall this is where uh, different countries are at with respect to phasons so I'll, i'll pass it over to you uh, especially given that we have very limited time yeah thank you thank you so much uh, aditya Erika, I see that in the chat box, most of the questions has have been answered. I think, uh, but one question, uh, I think the figures which I can read from the chat box is the question which Amy had uh, posed: What is the peak demand and the total generation which has been considered in year two zero three two? I think the answer which I find in the from the authors of the report is the peak demand of three hundred and seventy gigawatt. and the total generation requirement of close to 2700 terawatt hour in the calendar year 2032 that is what is given here and and may i request now about the bss capacity also i think uh, nation would you like to answer the answers are there in the chat box and for the benefit of all the speakers i would like to sort of a mention their numbers are there but uh, may i request nation you would you like to read out and uh, explain a little bit if you want uh yes sir uh so uh, we have shared the numbers for uh, the different uh, scenarios uh, and uh, uh, so uh, for the base case scenario we have uh, a solar build up of little over 350 where we have uh, the bss build up or up around uh, uh, 50 gigawatts hour with a pump storage build up of 28 Uh, and this is a scenario that has two uh, eighty six uh, a little more than two eighty six gigawatt of uh, coal and around one hundred and twenty gigawatts of wind. Uh, and then as the BSS cost uh, declines uh, faster from twelve percent to twenty percent, uh, so in twelve percent we have almost uh, close to two hundred gigawatt hours of battery storage with uh, a pump storage still being twenty eight, but we have a much higher solar. 
uh, 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 you know, uh, addition of 411 with coal capacity reducing by almost 10 gigawatts. Uh, and, yeah, and finally, for the 20% uh, BSS cost declines, we see solar uh, crossing actually 500, but we need uh, uh, more than 600 gigawatt hours of, storage, uh, of battery storage, BSS storage uh, by 2032. Uh, yeah, but this is these are broadly uh, the numbers that we have. Uh, thank you, thank you, Nishwin. Thank you so much. And I think for the benefit of the audience, I would like to mention that the report is uh, already up on, has been uploaded on the website of Ember and Terry. I think one can go through the report in detail, and we will sort of a request to all the attendees and all the experts who are there to be giving more questions or any observation they have about, because the idea is to develop it further and see that what best can be understood. Given the uncertainties of various kinds of uh, things which are there, I think one uh, still needs to uh, fine tune it very periodically. I think that is what is the most important requirement which comes out. Now we have two, three minutes left and I would say that before I sort of try to summarize, I would like to say that a big thank you to all the panelists, Amy, Samir, Abhishek, uh, Jyoti ji, Aditya, all of you, very, thank, very, very thankful to all of you. I think these type of studies are extremely important. Various organizations and institutes are doing these studies and various aspects need to be looked into. We at Ember and Terry, we have looked into some of the aspects and we plan to do a series of uh, sort of a such uh, reports wherein we will look into various aspects one by one. So as Samir, you mentioned about the pump storage, Amy, you also mentioned about the pump storage. I think pump storage also comes in the various studies which have been done by Ember Terry and that Terry also we did up for the 2050. First, I will touch upon that point that uh, the resource potential assessment is extremely important. I think the NIVE has already done the resource potential assessment for wind at a higher Hawaii. But in regard to the solar potential assessment, I think it is a work in progress. We at Terry are also doing uh, some work on this. Maybe uh, very soon we will bring out certain impressions. Uh, the other day, Mr. Jagdale from MNRE had uh, taken a meeting in, in the context of Net Zero Working Group. MNRE is also doing something. So I think the solar resource potential which is extremely important. I think that is one thing which one needs to look at and then see where best we are positioned to be. And in the absence of uh, the good resource potential, I think we are sort of a compelled to be relying on coal, but for no other reason, but this will remain the reason that, yeah, coal continues to remain a sort of a resource to rely on because of these reasons. The cost trajectories of various storage technologies, et cetera, extremely important. The uncertainty in demand profile is very, very important and how best we can capture them. And it is always a challenge in a longer term time domain that how do we factor them in? And generally people feel that if the peak is going to be more or if the demand is going to be more peaky, but there are demand side measures, there are sort of a peak shifting measures, demand response measures, et cetera. I think they can then even out some of these the new users, which uh, Samir mentioned, the electric vehicles, the electrolyzers, and the data centers, I think they are also forming a part of discussion in the Niti IO working group, where we at Terry are also participating, and these are extremely important as we move forward. So one thing looks very certain that we need to look at these things very, very closely, and every two to three years, one has to come out with a picture, which is sort of a looking at a near-term picture, a mid-term picture, and a longer-term picture. And given the type, scale what we are going to be requiring in India and given the demand growth we are going to be having, I think it is required to look at the longer term solutions and options, midterm solutions and options, and the short term solution and option. Because otherwise we will lock, be locking into certain longer term of solutions which may not be suboptimal, which may not be optimal, they may rather be suboptimal. So I think periodic revisiting of demand and demand profiles technologies and their costs and what best can be done in the country to realize the dream of achieving 500 gigawatt of non-fossil fuel in the medium term and net zero in the longer term. That is what looks to be extremely important. I think it will be difficult to summarize what 
various speakers have spoken about. But in nutshell, I think uh, we take note of the points which have been mentioned by the experts. And I think uh, the task is cut for the team to do further work and share with you all. And we also look forward to your uh, suggestions uh, as and when you get a chance to look at the complete report. And with this, I would like to thank all of you and for participating. And we will look forward to your participation in the future events which we want to carry on this uh, topic of thematic importance. Thank you and see you in very soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.